This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live here in the one o'clock block on a given beautiful Monday morning afternoon <laughs> with likable science. Uh, and we have Ethan Allen, of course. He is our likable science host and special scientist person who helps us understand the world around us. Thank you, Jay. Hi, Ethan. Hi, Jay. Good to be here. <laughs> this is going to be a very interesting discussion. We've titled this Advances in the Realms of the Invisible and Ephemeral. It's only fair to say what, what in the world we're talking about. <laughs> the invisible refers to viruses, and the ephemeral rever refers to brain waves. And so we're going to find out some really extraordinary scientific um, discoveries about both of those things today with Ethan. Wow. This comes from the MIT News. We like the MIT News because it always tells us about science at the frontier. Mm -hmm. So let's talk first about viruses, Ethan. Okay. First, what is a virus? Right. So viruses are these peculiar things. We'll just call them things for now. And they lie right on that edge of living versus non-living. For much of the time of its existence, a virus really shows no sign of being alive. It is basically a protein shell, some genetic material inside that shell, and some sort of little hooks on the end that it can grab onto a, a, another cell with. And that's all it is. It, it's not respiring, it's not metabolizing, it's not using any energy, it's not producing any waste, it's not doing it's anything. It's a piece of it, DNA, it, it, that's just, what just, it is. Yep, yep, surrounded by some protein, just floating around. But it is physical and it can hook on things right. and, and once give it, you a terrible headache sometimes. Well, once it grabs onto a cell, it then injects its genetic material into the cell. Uh -huh. That genetic material basically hijacks the cell's own machinery. Uh -huh and gets that cell to start producing viruses instead of producing stuff for the cell. It replicates the original virus, virus. that came and injected it. Right. So it, so it multiplies the virus, and it's the multiplication that gives you the headache. Well, in some cases, it's the rupturing of the, that, is that cell and may produce 100 or 1,000 copies of that virus and then explode because it's basically burned out now. Yeah. And now there are 1,000 more viruses around off yeah. to infect new cells. And yeah. very rapidly, if those are, if they're your cells in your head, that could be very bad, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and, and a couple of things that, you know, just to deal with um, the public understanding here, viruses mutate, right? How does that work? Well, all, all life forms can mutate because all life forms basically... It's not just viruses. No, no, no. Bacteria, uh, eukaryotes, every, we can mutate, you know? Uh, so, yeah, uh, viruses, by virtue of their very simple structure, if they, if they get their genetic material zapped by random ultraviolet photon that comes in knocks out a base out of their genetic material, I mean, it, it will show up right away. They're, they'll, genetic, they'll inject that genetic material into a bacteria or another cell, and probably the whole system goes down and it doesn't do anything yeah. because it's no longer effective. Yeah. Well, 99 uh, times out of 100, probably. So but, let's visit that. I mean, um, a, a virus doesn't, doesn't have a um, metabolic process. Right. It doesn't think. It just has these sort of chemical DNA characteristics. Right. And, um, and it replicates itself, too, doesn't it? No. It, it, it does it, not replicate it, itself. It relies on a cell for everything. The host, so it, to it, speak. Exactly. It, it, it simply sort of floats around, and when it comes in contact with a, with a suitable host cell, it latches on that cell, injects its genetic material. That's the one thing it really sort of does, is injects its genetic material. And that, you could again think of as sort of a chemical reaction almost. Once, once its receptors are engaged, it says everything, everything's primed and ready, shoot that stuff in. So, so there's various kinds of viruses. Oh, I mean, you get a cold virus. virus, you get yep. a flu virus. Yep. I mean, you get all kinds of really ugly right. viruses. Right. What's the difference? Well, different viruses are uh, do different things. Cold, flu, lots of different things. Viruses specialize on different kinds of uh, organisms. There are viruses that go after only plants. There are viruses that go after only fungi. There are viruses that go after only bacteria. And that was the intriguing thing about this MIT work is they found this virus in the ocean water, it's incredibly common, uh, as in there are 10 million of them per milliliter of water. Now, a milliliter is like a thousandth of a quart of water, like less than a so teaspoon. It's a, it's a, yeah, a little tiny it's a tip of your finger. Yeah, yeah, tip of your finger are worth of water. 10 million of these viruses probably in every single mill, milliliter of ocean water, and nobody knew they were here. Now, every, every, every 
sample of ocean so water, water probably that you could ever take will probably show something like 10 million of these things so we didn't know this <laughs> right. before this, this huge yeah and the, these are a huge uh, it's a whole class of viruses and one difference these viruses typically just have a shell they, they don't have any apparent tail that most of the viruses have an extrusion a tail of some sort that's part of their whole gripping mechanism these guys don't have that in any obvious sense and that's why apparently they've missed on a lot of the screen. They haven't been picked up. It's because they didn't have, we were looking for the tail, we didn't see a tail. Right. We assume no virus is there. Right. How can you see this now? I mean, how can they see it without the tail? Well, you, you can, if you look, you can, uh, with an electron microscope, a transmission electron microscope, or even a scanning EM these days, you can f actually you can see. You see DNA with electron microscope. Yeah, so you can certainly see a virus. So this is a piece of DNA. A wrapped up in some protein, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the protein is typically bigger than the DNA in some sense. Uh, so, you, yeah, you, you typically will see a structure, a capsid is what they call the head of the virus, uh, the thing, the, the chamber that holds the, the, the DNA, basically. Here we are, um, you know, we've solved the, the you know, the, the DNA, um, what do you call it, the, 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 the genome, right. the genome for so many type uh, organisms, right. including the human right. organism. Um, and we have had, you know, science uh, moving at a break, breakneck speed for, you know, gosh, uh, at least 100 years, really. Right. Uh, we have done amazing, amazing things with science, and only now, only this week, we have found this, this, this completely ubiquitous new kind of virus yeah. we didn't even know existed until now. Yeah. What's it's, going on here? Well, this is, it's, it's really actually typical, because it's sort of the big flashy stuff that catches our attention, right? So everyone's aware of you know, the pandas, the, the tigers, the elephants, you know, all these big things catch our attention, the redwood trees, right? And we tend to ignore the little stuff, but the little stuff is really makes up a whole lot of the living world. So in, in a typical area of temperate forest, the mass of ants is equal to the mass of mammals. Now, if you think about that, I mean, so uh, an acre of forest may have a few dozen squirrels and some chipmunks and a weasel or two, maybe a deer. How many ants do you think that is? That's a whole lot of ants, right? I mean, it's a whole lot of ants just to make up the weight of it's one, the one chipmunk. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and much of the world, the whole world really runs that way. It's, it's the little stuff, the little tiny microbes that are everywhere that are really controlling a lot of the world, really running the world for their benefit, you know, they're reproducing themselves and trying to get by. Yeah, uh, and they have lasted for, what, billions of years, these these little protein things with right. DNA inside, yeah. these viruses. Yeah. And, and many of them have teamed up with bigger things, and our cells are full of stuff that probably started out as independent organisms that, that some years ago found they could happily live together, all, all the little energy packets, the little mitochondria in each of our cells probably used to be independent organisms. They still reproduce independently within your cells. You so, um, you know, are, are they only in the ocean or are, the, are they in other things too? Are they yeah. in us, for example? Th that's what's as yet unknown about this new class of viruses. These things are, are interesting. They, are, they go after bacteria, which makes them potentially useful, right? Because we're always fighting new strains of bacteria and a lot of our antibacterial drugs are losing their efficacy because yes. the viruses are getting yes. immune. These particular viruses are, are rather intriguing because they can often, a single type of this virus will go after multiple types of bacteria, which is very unusual. Viruses tend, have tended, the ones we knew of, to be very specialized. One type of virus will go after one type of bacteria, a different virus, a different bacteria. These guys, a single type of this virus, can go after very different bacteria and kill them. And so, How do they do that? They typically latch on. Again, they latch on, they shoot their genetic material in and co-opt the Bacteria's gen genetic material, so it now starts producing viruses. It neutralizes the, GN the DNA well, of the bacteria. Well, it, it makes that DNA start working to produce viruses instead of producing bacteria. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> right, right. And so suddenly that bacteria gets filled up with these viruses until it bursts open. And kind of the cancer of the bacteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really interesting. And what they don't know yet, they found this in the ocean where we're finding all kinds of new things. So the ocean microbiome is just immense. This is really, um, it's really a new thing. Yeah, it's a whole new and, frontier. And so, okay, so you, you have certain kinds of viruses that will attack only one sp right. sp species. Right. the right term. Right. One species of bacteria, right. and you have other kinds this new kind, I suppose. What do you call the new kind? Uh, it's got a long, long name. Forget right, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, another kind. Now the new kind just right. discovered this fancy kind 
uh, which will, you know, kill a lot of different kinds of right. bacteria. Yeah. Uh, so the big question I put to you, I hope you're ready for this one, is can we control what kind of bacteria this new virus will attack? Yes, and that's that's a very interesting point, and the, and the real lovely potential of this. If we can sort of chemically dissect this virus well enough and see what it is, what makes up its latching mechanism, as well as what its general structure is, and of course sequence its DNA or RNA, not, not clear which it is, uh, then we should presumably, with CRISPR technology, yes, be, CRISPR, we be able to switch, CRISPR, switch, yeah. switch in a few, switch in and out a few things, and change that around, and say, go after Staphylococcus aureus instead, you know, or yeah. go after the, the the you know whatever bacteria we, we want, you know, yeah, and uh, suddenly you've got a, a potent new tool that the bacteria probably is utterly unprepared to deal with. Yeah, so a, a couple of things flow out of that. So we have MIRSA. Every hospital is right. terrified about MIRSA right, right. because they can't stop it. Right. And it seems to, you right. know, be found in hospitals. Right. Um, and uh, gee whiz, that's very threatening. Right. But I suppose if we are able to control this, this new kind of virus, the one without the tail, whatnot, right. um, then we can say, go after them. Go after the all of the, the MRSA different kind of MIRSA. Virus. Uh, uh, bacteria, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Kill them all. Right. Yep. Yeah. And a new kind of antibiotic emerges. A yeah. biotic is narrow or as wide as you want. We can create a new, right. but just using nature itself. Right. Again, just just like we found CRISPR. I mean, CRISPR was basically developed by bacteria as an antiviral uh, mechanism, and now we're t we're looking at using a virus to go after bacteria. I mean, it, it's it's there's a, a beautiful symmetry there. It is. It is. It's beautiful. <laughs> But you know, I mean, it's, uh, what's interesting is it's so ubiquitous at the same right. time we didn't know anything about it. Yeah. And that means we don't know exactly how to do this oh, or yet. what the side effects are in doing but, this. But the amazing thing is that the rate our technology is now evolving, probably, I'm guessing, within two or three years, things will start coming out. There'll be clinical applications from this discovery. You know, whereas two decades ago, it would have taken a decade or more to, to get anything out to begin testing it, and now yeah, the I, I tests it's, are better. Yeah, it's, it's going to. But you still have to do human tests, and, well, and the FDA doesn't let you do that so quick. Yeah, yeah. And there, are, there are, But somebody could come up. Somebody in another country, for example, <laughs> could come up with an. And I mean, China. Mm -hmm. Take sure. China, um, because they're very good at this kind. Mm -hmm. um, they could, they could take these special new, newly discovered viruses sure. and make a com make, an uh, antibacteria kind of thing. You know, a new, a new flu vaccine that would yeah. just. Boom. Let me take it one step further, though. Okay. okay. So some bacteria are synergistic with the human. Many, many, many. Most. Many, of many, your, many. We most are of your, a composite yes. of you know human cells and also lots and lots millions of bacteria, millions right. of virus yep. apparently. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's a balance, mm -hmm. and it's a delicate balance. Right. And if anything goes out of balance, right. then we go the wrong way, right. and we don't survive. Yeah. So if I use this new a tailless virus to kill what I think are bacteria that are detrimental to the human mm -hmm. being, um, but they're in fact synergistic in some way, maybe I didn't fully understand, mm -hmm. then I could be killing the same yeah. human being. Yeah. Knock off the bacteria, but kill the person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's a lot we don't understand yet. You know, the same the staph bacteria that live harmlessly, apparently, on our skin, day in and day out, perhaps even doing good things for our skin, for all we know, are these same bacteria that if they get into you and out of control are deadly. So yeah, you, don't, you want to be very careful about sort of when you start tweaking with Mother Nature at some, st at some stage, what do you, do you know when you pull on this thread? What's going to unravel? And the yeah. answer usually is no. We haven't a clue. So some <laughs> scientists in some place around the world, right. maybe not the U.S. No. I don't think the U.S. Uh, you know has the same primacies it used to have mm -hmm. in this kind of science. They say, well, we're going to develop this uh, not just to, you know, ideally kill bacteria that are harmful mm -hmm. to human beings. We actually want to kill human beings. We want to weaponize mm -hmm. this thing. Right. Well, there is is that too. You could, in theory, take use CRISPR technology in some sense and tweak it around to produce one of these viruses that went specifically after people and, and decided that you know, it, would, it would infect skin cells and make your skin cells start producing viruses instead of producing more skin cells. And suddenly, if, if you release that, and we all start Either intentionally the virus or, yeah, right. or inadvertently, yeah. 
And then, of course, uh, the whole thing about the spread, like H, H1, what is it, N5, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, it could be spread in any number of ways uh, mm -hmm. that, that yeah. surprise you. Yeah. And then we could have an epidemic the size of we've well, never seen humanity. before, right? Yeah. 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 And on that happy note, <laughs> Ethan, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take this finger, which could <laughs> contain water with 10 million yeah. of these tailless viruses. I'm going to shake it at the screen. Watch what happens. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists, both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Hey, hey baby. That's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. It's a beautiful Monday. I'm Jay Fidel. We just came back from our break with Ethan Allen. He's a scientist, and we're on Likeable Science, talking about advances in the realms of the invisible, namely viruses, and the ephemeral, namely brainwaves. So we're in the second part of our journey today, <laughs> and, and let's talk about brainwaves. MIT News came up with something on brainwaves too, didn't it? Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. So, you know, uh, brainwaves are basically a, a pa uh, patterns that show up about how our brain cells are firing. Our brain cells all work through, by shooting electrical impulses around. We don't tend to think of them that way, but that's, that's how every neuron in your body actually works. It, if it gets enough stimulus, it shoots an impulse, it goes down, it acts on, that causes a release of chemicals into a little synapse. If the receiving neuron from that synapse gets enough input, it then fires another little spike, and this gets repeated, and a thought occurs, or an action occurs, or whatever. Yeah, but, but the, it works differently in, in your arm, where it's, it's a muscular, or a sensory kind of message, and in your brain where you have thoughts, right? Well, I mean, basically, they're all it's the, the neuron part of it is all the same. Okay. The, the question is whether the neuron is connected to other neurons or in your as in your arms. So it's wired. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. And so when you start looking at any given little one, the neuron is blitzing away at its own little rate of speed, depending on what inputs it's getting. But if you put a, a sort of skull cap of electrodes on, you know, sensors for electrical activity, you can watch patterns of firings that are sort of big summations of millions and millions and millions of cells firing. And what they've known for years, scientists have known, is that there, there are a set of patterns. There are patterns that occur when you sleep. They're very regular kinds of one's called slow wave sleep. There's another called rapid eye movement sleep, which when your eyes are twitching and the, the spiking of the mm -hmm. electrical patterns in your brain are different. Mm -hmm. And they've named a number of these from the, after Greek letters. And what they've discovered is this one called uh, beta, the beta wave activity, which they've known about for some while. And they've felt it's been associated with the consolidation of memory. But now they found really what it's, what it's doing or what it's really what the fine point is, it's basically serving as a gateway function in short-term memory. So they've, they gave people tests to say, see, uh, if you see a sequence of A and then B, and that sequence occurs again, you know, press a button. But don't press a button until A then B occurs. So what the this beta activity is associated with, uh, if you see A, B, and then an A comes up again, you immediately get this big spike of beta because it's waiting to see. Now, okay, I'm holding this in mind because I've seen one of the primary cues. Is the next thing going to be B or not? If some other stimulus than A shows up, there's no, no spike okay, in the beta. Okay, so you're after. looking at thinking. Yeah, exactly. And so, so um, we have the skull cap. Uh, the skull cap just sort of takes a, a picture. Mm -hmm. and it gives me a graphical image of the firing of the of the synapses. Right. And if I look at the picture, you know, like with artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. I can tell, you know, what what that all means, uh, whether it's selecting A, selecting B, mm -hmm. wh whether it's a positive or a negative, whatever. And I can get a look into brain waves. Yeah. And with those brain waves, I can also I can find out, at least in gross terms these days, what you are thinking. 
In, in some sense, yes. Probably the, the uh, skull cap and watching the brain waves isn't the most sophisticated way these days. The, the functional magnetic resonance imaging machinery these days is, is getting a lot of press for being a tool that people can discern real thought patterns. Yeah, uh, but that's only a matter of time, isn't it? Probably. Because soon enough we'll have these MRI machines that are look the, just the like skull caps. caps. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, very, very likely that, that we'll be able to discern patterns of brains in, in very brain activity in very subtle ways, such, such as an MRI can now do. Okay, yeah. so uh, what, what you really, what, you know, you really got my attention when you started telling me about um, people who have been unconscious or um, beyond the reach of communication, apparently, for years and years, such as Robin Williams was in the movie Awakenings. Right. And uh, then uh, he was a doctor, mm -hmm. and he came up with some dopamine drug, and certain, a certain protocol of dopamine drug, which actually woke Robert De Niro, mm -hmm. who played the patient oh, okay. in that movie. It's a powerful movie, mm -hmm. and it was a true movie, too. Mm -hmm. that, it didn't work forever, it worked for a while, but it showed that you could awake somebody like that. Yes. Now, this whole thing about brain waves, you know, gets into that realm, doesn't it? We're right. going to have somebody who is sleeping for 20, 30 years, completely apparently unconscious, mm -hmm. but not necessarily so. How does that work? Right. right. So, some a uh, few years ago, they began looking more close at these people in so-called persistent vegetative states, uh, or uh, now it's now it's called locked-in syndrome because. They wondered, are these people, what are these people experiencing? What are their brains actually doing? And at that point, a few years ago, they actually had a good deal of information when they would put normal people into a functional MRI machine, what, what their brains did, what they did when they were resting, what they did when they were reading, what they did when they were asked particular questions. You could ask a, a person lying in a machine, for instance, imagine you're out playing tennis. And certain parts of your brain, like your motor cortex, all starts firing in, in rhythmic patterns and other, other kinds of patterns, very typical of, you know, and fairly, fairly consistent from person to person to person uh, in terms of this, the types of areas that light up. So uh, hold for a minute, okay? Yeah. So I'm asking you, right. and you can't communicate this to me, but I'm asking you uh, to imagine mm -hmm. playing tennis. tennis. Right. And then I have my, my MRI, a skull cap right. on your head, and... And I can get a picture of the way the synapses are yeah, uh, parts are of the firing. brain that are more active, less active. And yeah. I use artificial intelligence to translate that picture of firing, that graphical image of the firing. You know, over time, we'll have a library of what this firing, you know, yep. sequence tells us and what that one tells us. Mm -hmm. After a while, we'll know that what you're talking about, what you're thinking about, your brain is mm -hmm. is envisioning. Right. Playing tennis. Yes. We'll know. We'll know what you're thinking. Exactly. Exactly. This, this, this is actually a very important thought. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're not anywhere near there. We're, we're beginning to get a few pages in the first book to put into that library yeah, at this yeah. point. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's now we can see it's there. But the, the amazing thing when they found, when they stuck these persistently vegetative state people in an MRI, was how normal their brain activity looked. And they're very puzzled, the scientists were very puzzled, because they sort of thought these people that would show nothing. Yeah. They'd have, show very grossly abnormal brain activity. But some of them, not all of them, some of them did show indeed grossly abnormal activity. But some of them showed very remarkably normal activity. And they went to some of these people when they were in the machine and said, so imagine you're out there on the tennis court playing tennis. And what they would see in these people is exactly what you would see in a normal person. Suddenly the same motor cortex areas light up and the same other areas suppress, and you see the same kinds of pattern of activity that, again, your AI machine would immediately say, oh, this person's That's thinking tennis. about playing. Yeah. This person's thinking about playing tennis. So, no, yeah. suppose, uh, suppose you've got the skull cap on, you can't communicate with me, you're Robert De Niro in the movie, and I say, Ethan, how much is two and two? Mm -hmm. And you come back and say, right. I'm giving you the picture for four. Mm -hmm. right. Or, um, you know, is the answer yes or no? Right. And you come back and give me an answer, yes or no. Right. Now I'm talking to you. Right. In, in, some, in some sense, as these technologies evolve, yes, we'll, we'll be able to start doing that. And the locked-in people will actually gain a communication channel you know, back. To, so I'm having a conversation. Yeah. You'll Even be, though you're out of it, completely right. out of it. Right. Because the, this is why they call it locked-in syndrome. These people are actually normal in every sense, except they're locked in. They, they cannot respond. That was they the case in the movie. Yeah. They can't blink an eye. They can't twist, twitch nothing. an eye. They can't no raise motor, a finger. No nothing. No yeah. way. Um, but now, right. we can know what they're thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, it's, it's clumsy. I mean, fMRI machines are huge, expensive machines. Are, they're hard to operate. You know, you can't really keep people in them very long. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but someday in the not too far distant future, right, 
they presumably like almost all the rest of our technologies, yeah. One pound. They, they shrink down, <laughs> the cost drops, and suddenly, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So now, now I know what the blocked in person right. is thinking, and because I have a library by that time right. using artificial intelligence right. of, of really any, right. any thought, right. I can and, figure it out. And then meanwhile, of course, if you think, then you go full circle and you stick stimulators back on their main motor tracks, yeah. so they think, like, I'm gonna get up and walk. And then, although their brain can't really do it, they've made this thought pattern. Their library has said, oh, so he wants to walk. I'm going to stimulate the walking. So you, but you've got to have an, an apparatus, though, to make him walk. Well, it may his apparatus muscles. may not do anything. Well, if he's been well maybe you could talk to his muscles. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, muscle talking, you're talking to the nerves that run the muscles, basically, is what you're doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if presumably he hasn't been lying there for 30 years and his muscles are all atrophied, yes, then he would be able to get up this and walk. Is pretty sexy yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, again, great potential. Uh, we're, we're dreaming here. It's, it's down the road. Not, not tomorrow, not the next day, but, well, you know. I want to talk about uh, truth serum. I want to talk about lie detectors. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, there was a professor at the at the university who was able to tell the, mm, the the nature of your heartbeat through a brick wall. He was trying to sell that to the military so they could see the bad guys, you know, in the Central mm -hmm. Asia through a wall. They would know they're there by virtue of hearing the heartbeat. It was mm -hmm. it sound? Okay? Right. Um, and you know, the one of the side effects of that is if if I can hear your heartbeat in a certain speed and rhythm, then I know whether you're telling the truth. Some it's extent. sort of like a, a lie detector, yeah. but more sophisticated. Yeah. And truth serum makes you speak the truth somehow. I don't know if that really works, but that's you know we've right. seen a lot of art about that. So in this case, okay, um, I could I could actually uh, tell whether you're telling the truth. I could find in my library. I could find the pattern of the synapse, uh, you know, connection uh, to tell me whether you're lying or not. You could be answering my questions whether you like it or not. Uh, is this possible? Yeah, it gets trickier because lying isn't a simple thing. You know, right? Some people, most people, are reasonably truthful, and to tell a lie, particularly a lie of some significance, actually causes physiological changes, which is how the lie detectors actually work. The person has to really sort of concentrate on telling a lie, and to some extent, and this is. Why, yes, the, the pulse goes up, the palms start sweating, you know, da da da. Uh, there are people who are very good at lying, who like to lie, who lie without compunction, and, you know, have no. And those people, you'd have to do a whole sort of separate library with them, right? Because they're not going to necessarily okay. follow. Artificial the, intelligence. Uh, yeah, know. again, right. Hopefully, an AI system could pick up this, this person is really a sociopath who does not care whether they're telling the truth or lie. So. Maybe the picture is, is deceptive right. that way. Right. But what I want to just, just point out that we're, we're not talking about somebody who's locked in now. Right. We're talking about an ordinary person. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a person perhaps we're interrogating in uh, Birobijan or mm -hmm. in. Uh, in the gulag, you right. know, we want to find out exactly what this person is thinking, and mm -hmm. God knows where that could go, right? right? And we could ask him a question, right. um, and we could find out exactly what his reaction is right down to the core. Sure. You, um, you, this, in terms of, you know, in terms of uh, dystopia, yeah, in terms of sure. dictatorship, yeah. in terms of 1984, George sure. Orwell, this is pretty scary stuff, yeah, Ethan. Yeah, I mean, you might be able, with a combination of, of chemicals, hypnosis, and pointed interrogation techniques, you might be able to get that person to reveal all sorts of information about, about imagine yourself walking to your next meeting of your group, you know, da da da, and suddenly in their mind they're pinpointing yeah. where this is, now, yeah. even if they don't want to ever say it. You know? Yeah, this is not yeah. torture, this is right. non-invasive, well, yeah. doesn't hurt, it's just reading your mind, yeah. really reading your yeah, mind. Yeah, when you're going that, that deep into someone's mind. So it goes for the proposition in our time in the 21st century that there is no Walden Pond. <laughs> there is no, you know, Great Pacific Northwest, and there are no secrets at all. That's well, what's it's, happening it's here. Getting harder and harder, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Great Jay. Great discussion as always. Well, fun to talk oh, with you. What oh, you oh. really say there? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean it. <laughs>